Jamie Haynes, Ashley Petri, and Natalia Aronovich, uh, Jerry Maravia. Today we're going to be focusing on hair and makeup artistry, independent clothing and accessories designers, trademark, copyrights, all that fun stuff, crowdfunding and distribution platform uh, for filmmakers. How do you decide on what talent to represent? Okay, that's a great question and that's a hard question because I get, I was just telling Megan that daily I get people emailing on Instagram, wanting to come to the agency. And there's some amazing talent out there. I will say that. Mm -hmm. um, but usually I do it through my other artists because they are out there working. So they'll call me or text me and be like, Hey, you know, let's say it's a fashion stylist and they'll say, Hey, you know, I'm working with this great makeup artist. Let's say one of my fashion stylists is working with a great makeup artist. They'll say, oh, there's a great makeup artist on the set. You should meet them. So I'll even sometimes go down and meet oh, wow. that person, you know, or I tell them, oh, have them get in touch with me after, you know. But I do also, you know, when people email or, or send us anything on Instagram, I do look through people. Um, I give a lot of attention to people. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, certainly like my niche in the industry. Um, and I also know what it's like to knock on doors. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in production for years and I had to, um, you know, call and get work and work for My entire career was freelance. Designer to, you know, kind of like get into your world and you know, say like I'm a brand worth looking at. Yeah, I would say make sure before anything else you have your vision established for what your brand is. And that means not just like, oh I created a line of t-shirts with some graphics on it, but like who is your customer? Like it has to be a full holistic representation of your brand. So it's a like brands today are more of a, a lifestyle. Yeah. And so really like who is your customer? Who do you want to sell to in terms of like what stores do you want to be in? Are you like a mass market brand? Are you a specialty brand? Like decide on your customer and even your store positioning and then start to reach out because I think if you reach out too soon, you might get a little, you might get dismissed in yeah. terms of like, oh, I don't know, I don't really take this that seriously, it just looks like another whatever brand. But if it really has this like strong, you know, aesthetic and this overall representation of like who you are, yeah. I think buyers and like myself are more inclined to really like dig into it and meet with you. And so we have like a um, customer love inbox, we call it, which is where young designers can actually email us their collections. We actually do check it. It's not like a black hole of emails. We check it every single day. That's amazing. See, people do check their email. Yes. Okay. It might feel a little discouraging because you feel like you're emailing to nobody. Sure. But um, we do check it. So I have a men's counterpart who does men's. I do women's. And then we kind of do everything in between. So we're constantly um, vetting that inbox. Right. Um, and then, yes, we do feel like a lookbook is necessary yeah. to also include with a line sheet because your lookbook is your visual guide. So even if that's like a link to your website where you have like your Instagram feed as your lookbook, mm -hmm. that totally works, but you need some type of visual yeah. representation overall. Let's say a, family, a filmmaker has a vision, a script, but not the finances, I guess, to you know make it happen. Let's, let's talk solutions. Yeah. Um, basically, I always try to break it down into like two different tracks or like ways to think about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one, which is the most important, is like who is the audience mm -hmm. for this film? Yeah. You know, uh, often I think traditionally in art making spaces, artists create things in a vacuum and they're like, I'll push it out into the world and then figure out who was going to watch right. it or like After want that, to yeah. partake in it. And um, that's an increasingly challenging as there's much more art people have exposure to. Uh, and um, you know, if you can really think about who is going to pay for this to watch it and who really wants to see it, um, you're kind of putting yourself ahead of the curve because in any sort of independent arts career, the two things you have only two things you have control over really as an artist, despite changes in technology and economics, is uh, um, uh, ownership over your IP, okay. which is like you know your thing that you your vision, your brainchild, your intellectual uh, property, which yes. we learned about uh, in a previous industry exchange oh, cool. episode. Um, and then the other one is the direct communication with your audience. Mm -hmm. So if you have an audience of people who support what you do and you own the thing that you're making, then you can continue to like have a living. Yeah. So it really is in your benefit to think about, okay, who is this for? And to really think about um, outside of demographics, you know, unless you have a multi-million dollar studio 
marketing budget. Uh, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got those all the time. Yeah. Totally, yeah, exactly. It doesn't seem attainable for most people. Um, so like, you know, just thinking about who is going to watch this and where can I start to reach them, whether in the online space or in the real world. How to license art while continuing to hold rights to my work. Um, that's a that's a really great question. How, yes. how do you go about that? Because you can have like you can assign your rights, okay, or you can license for a, like a period of a term. So what what is what is licensing necessarily mean to somebody who doesn't? Oh, your, license your, is like you let someone else use your use, use your idea, mm -hmm. use your work. But if you assign the rights, mm -hmm. then you give the rights to someone That's else. It. Yeah, so you have to be a very, like if you're going to sign a contract or something, if you see assign, you are giving all your rights. Ooh, yes, so okay. see if it's like a license, you can license for a specific term in like, what, let's say one year. Mm -hmm. For a specific media, mm -hmm. like just for Instagram. One year you have the rights to this photo. I'm giving you, I'm allowing you to use it. Yeah, That's and fine. I keep the rights to myself. Yeah, so so yeah. what's the process for mm -hmm. interviewing and, and signing on with an agency? What, is, what does that look like? Okay, so my, every, I'm sure other agencies are different. My process is, so if I decide I like somebody, um, I usually set up a meeting. I always like to meet somebody face to face because I think that's really important. We have to make sure we have chemistry. Mm. We have to just make sure that we jive yeah. um, because we don't want, you know, we just, we're going to be working together, you know, but um, so we'll meet and then we talk, I give them my spiel. They tell me about them. Prior to that meeting, I will look at all of their work. Uh, I will see what they need help with, what they should add, what they should take away on their websites. Um, they eventually, all of their work gets to Rouge Artist's website. Okay. So the, some of them will continue to keep their own website. That's fine. It's up to them. But we bring their work to our website so that we can uh, sell them properly yeah. um, and manage them properly. What, what takeaways can you give them? What, what advice for emerging designers? Um, I mean, we kind of we kind of talked about that a little bit on um, how to develop that strong brand and stand out. Mm -hmm. um, but anything else that they need to to know? I would say don't be afraid to fail. I think don't that's the biggest fail. thing. I think sometimes it's really hard because you think about all of the things that you're up against at once in terms of having to create this line, um, go and put yourself out there. How do you go to market? How do you do like? Use your network and use your resources available. Like Google is your best friend. Mm -hmm. Talk to other artists, talk to other designers that yeah. are doing the same thing, and you'll find that like people are in the same struggle. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there. And like if you really are serious about you know reaching out to designers and or to buyers and yeah. becoming like a, a great brand, you have to put your, you have to market yourself. Yeah. You definitely like, need to do a good job of that. And it's hard. We have a question from the audience we're gonna get to in a minute. Um, was that, you know, you guys are just expanding and kind of like, almost like the more the merrier. Like there's room for everybody, you know, who definitely kind of like gets their, their ish in order. Yeah. 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 Um, so a question um, from the audience, advice for an accessories designer. Um, so we've kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but advice for accessory designers who are putting on a runway. Um, I would say partner with another designer who's okay. doing apparel. Okay. Typically, yeah. Um, I have personally not been to a jewelry or accessory runway show. Okay. I would say usually presentations are a little bit more impactful because everything's a little bit more still. Yeah. And you can create kind of a deeper experience that way. Um, I'd be really curious to see how that looks. Like, maybe I'm just not up on it. <laughs> but I would say, like, partnering with, like, apparel designer or somebody that can complement both collections will give you, like, a lot of notoriety. My next question is, at what point, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but at what point, I guess, in an artist's career, should they speak to a business lawyer? When they have the idea. <laughs> Because sometimes you have the idea and your idea cannot even be protected. Mm -hmm. So you start like invest your time and money mm -hmm. in something that already exists mm -hmm. or is, there's no protection. Okay. So if I'm a, a visual artist, let's say, um, I don't really, I haven't really honed my, you know, what I'm doing until I'm maybe two or three years into it, but I finally have found okay, I'm really great at creating pictographs, I know that, 
this is my this is my idea. This is what I'm going. Then I need to come talk to someone like you. Yes, who's... yes. Or like I said, there is a lot of resources online on the website. Yeah, on the website on the copyright.gov and uh, uspto.gov. 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 You guys go there for trademarks and patents. For trademarks and patents. Okay, <laughs> I'm learning so much. This is insane, and I don't even need to. Maybe I don't know. I am a wealth of ideas. That's true. Now let's touch a little bit on. You mentioned the festival circuit, and we've worked together. Uh, Rob, you know, had its third annual yeah. uh, film festival this year. That is that definitely something you. Is it for everybody? Is our film festivals for everybody? Is that something you recommend everybody do? Um, film festivals are a great opportunity to grow your audience, but they're not okay. going to necessarily open up a bunch of, you know, money like. I think often too, off, too often creators or the independent filmmakers they're waiting for the, all the hard stuff to be over. Yeah. Like some door is going to open and then they don't have to worry about money or yeah. whatever this it is. Magic button. Yeah. Um, yeah. If anything, I've learned from talking to filmmakers of all scales is that like um, that doesn't exist. Um, but film, uh, you know, I think it's important to be really targeted with your filmmaking uh, film festival strategy okay. to get the most out of it. So. Like, you know, they cost money. Submissions cost money. So, you know, you want to submit to a bunch of them, but that's going to cost you, like, hundreds or thousands of dollars, potentially. Yeah. So, like, for my film, I saw that it did well in uh, festivals that were Latino or Asian-specific. Okay. Or in cities like Los Angeles, yeah. where there's large Latino or that Filipino. That demographic is very yes. prevalent. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Um, so looking to, you know, just be much more targeted on that. Because if you look at, like, say, Sundance, which is a great festival, but... You know, like so many of those filmmakers like to do is like just go through their program and Google them. I'm like, oh, you work at the DGA and you work at CAA yeah. and you like, and so it can start to feel a little disillusioning. But you know, I was in DC at the Asian Pacific Film Festival there and like a packed audience for my short that played before this other feature and had people come up to me and you know say how much they liked the film and email gave me their email address to follow up with other stuff and so awesome. festivals are a really cool way to get to see other parts of the country and uh, really just grow your audience to who want to watch maybe the next thing that you're going to make. Yeah, yeah, that definitely, you know, you're talking about making sure things are niche, you're hitting your your target, you know, demographic, your target market. I think mm -hmm. apply that right to to film yeah. fests. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? That that makes sense. And email film festival programmers is like a good tip. Like if you can't afford it and you can look on their website, uh -huh. you can see what their email is, like ask for a waiver or oh, really? uh, an exception. Like you might not always get it, but every so often you do, yeah. you know, or at least they then know your name and the name of your film. 